Greetings, salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. This is your episode for Wednesday, April the 17th, 2013, and this is the best damn movie-related show on the internet. As always, my name is John Campy. I'm the senior editor over at AMC Movie News. And uh, once again, as you can see, I am not in the AMC Movie News studios. I'm actually in Las Vegas, Nevada right now for the annual CinemaCon event where the movie studios bring all their upcoming movies this year and show it off to theater owners like AMC, and we get to see a lot of cool stuff. And I want to start off today's show by talking about some of the cool stuff that I've been seeing now. Uh, Universal and Warner Brothers showed us a lot of cool stuff already, but obviously the thing I want to start with is... Zack Snyder, director of the of 300 and, of course, the upcoming Man of Steel, came out on stage at CinemaCon yesterday and uh, addressed us there and talked about how cool it was to make Superman. And they, sh they showed us first, now it's online now, but they showed us the world premiere of the new Man of Steel trailer. The first Man of St Steel trailer was uh, awesome. I say it's the best trailer of 2013 so far. It's magnificent. It's everything. I mean, the tone of it is is almost perfect. Uh, I love the look of Henry Cavill. I love the juxtapositions between his two fathers in uh, Russell Crowe and, and of course, Pa Kent. Uh, and Russell Crowe as uh, Jor-El. But this trailer tops it. It absolutely tops it. And the really neat thing is that it gives us a glimpse into a couple of things. For instance, we used to think in the first trailer, wait a minute, why is Kal-El, Clark Kent, suddenly a member of the cast of The Deadliest Catch? You know, you see him working on a fishing boat. Why is he wandering through the wilderness like the Incredible Hulk? And in this trailer, what's really revealed is that he has spent his life on the move because he keeps saving people and in doing so displaying his, his superhuman powers. And so then he has to disappear because he believes, you know, in the teachings that Pa Kent gave him that he can't let anybody know who he really is. And that's why we see him in the trailer always on the move and always going. And of course, we hear Lois Lane asking or talking about and narrating in the trailer about, I guess she's been hunting him down as her story, this mystery person who keeps saving people's lives and then disappearing. And that so that part was fascinating. We get to see a lot more of Michael Shannon. Of course, Boardwalk Empire uh, star Michael Shannon, who's playing General Zod. This is clearly a very different General Zod than what we saw in Superman 2. And I love the idea that they are giving him his own General Zod, his own personality for this film. And he looks great. And he looks menacing. And it, it just, it's incredible. A lot more action beats in this trailer. We also get to see action happening on Krypton. We get to see a lot of action happening on Earth. Um, Superman fighting who we can only assume is General Zod, but maybe it's some of his minions as well. It just looks fantastic. And I love the part where she says, because I always thought this was weird, like Superman from another world with a different alphabet and everything has a big giant S on it. I love the fact in this trailer, Amy Adams says, so what's with the S? And he says, actually, that's not an S. It's the symbol in our world for hope. And... I thought that was wonderful. Now, my friend Rodney Brazil, who runs a, a, a movie site called The Movie Snitch, emailed me last night and said, do you think they'll even use the word Superman in this movie? It can, because he pointed out, and this is true, stop and think about this for a second. My friend pointed out to me, Superman is really a very stupid name for a superhero. It's a very stupid name. If there was no Superman right now, and a comic book came out with a new character and called him Superman. We would think it's the most ridiculous thing we've ever heard. But we've grown up with Superman, so it's just kind of ingrained in us and we don't think of it in those terms. But I think my friend is right. I think there's a very good possibility we may not even hear the word Superman in Man of Steel at all. And for a first film, I'm fine with that. Eventually, he has to become known by his moniker. But for now, I would be okay with that. I think this trailer is outstanding. It's The movie's already my number one most anticipated film of the year. It only solidified that even more. Uh, the Warner Brothers president came out and, and talked about how proud they were of this movie, that they're extremely excited about it. Um, and I, I see nothing not to be excited about. I think this movie is going to absolutely be incredible. All right, also coming out of CinemaCon, there's lots of stuff to talk about CinemaCon, but I'll, I'll cover more of it when I get back to the AMC studios on Monday. But Warner Brothers showed off another film that I completely forgot about. 
It's called We Are or We Are the Millers. And it stars Jason Sudeikis and Jennifer Aniston. Um, also, it stars Ed Helms, Emma Roberts, uh, Catherine Han, who is one of the most, she is the most underappreciated comedic actors today. She is awesome in every single one of the comedies she appears in. She's always hilarious. Her part in um, Step Brothers was outstanding. She does not get the credit she deserves. Um, and also, one of my favorite characters on television right now, Nick Offerman, who of course plays Ron Swanson on Parks and Recreation. He's in this film as well. They showed us the very first trailer for We're the Millers. Now, the basic story of We're the Millers is this. Jason Sudeikis' boss, played by Ed Helms, tells him he wants him to pick up a small shipment of weed in Mexico and bring it across the border for him. So Sudeikis decides, instead of just a single lone male trying to move narcotics across the border, he gets his favorite stripper from his strip club that he frequents, Jennifer Aniston, to pretend to be his wife. Then he picks up a couple of kids just to pretend to be his kids so they can pretend to be a family. And I'm going to tell you right now, the, the trailer is not online yet. When you get to see the trailer, you will understand my excitement for this movie. I... I, the whole audience, we laughed a lot. This is going to be a very hard R-rated film, uh, rated comedy. It looks hilarious. Um, the, the parts with Catherine Hahn and Nick Offerman, who play a married couple together, look really funny. I, I think this is going to be a great comedy. You know, and Jason Sudeikis is magnificent. I, I, I honestly, I don't know why he's not at Jim Carrey or Jim Carell or, you know, uh, Seth Rogen level of... A-list comedic actors yet. Why he's not getting more completely lead roles. He was wonderful in Horrible Bosses. He was fantastic in A Good Old Fashioned Orgy. He's a a wonderful performer. He's just naturally really funny. I hope this marks the the launching point for uh, Sudeikis becoming a truly recognized as an A-list comedic actor in the movie sake. I'd love to see him in more stuff. Once again, the movie's called We're the Millers. Keep your eye open for it. We'll let you know on AMC Movie News as soon as they release the trailer for the public to see because I think you're going to really look forward to it. All right. Now we're going to come to another topic here. Some people say I've talked about this too much. But, you know, if, if you listen to sports radio like I do, you know, you can talk about LeBron James every single day. And I, I think I need to come back to this again. We talked a few times before about the notion of can actors be replaced? Should they be replaced? When should they be replaced? And, and of course, it all revolved around the whole idea of Robert Downey Jr. Uh, as Iron Man. Now, as I've stated on the show before, um, Robert Downey Jr. is the only one of the Avengers cast right now who no longer has a contract. His contract to play Iron Man ends with Iron Man 3. Now, I had some people emailing me to say, no, 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 John, he signed on for nine more films and blah, blah, blah. I, I, I don't know where you heard that from, but it's completely not true. Um, let me just say definitively, Robert Downey Jr., his contract with Disney to portray Tony Stark and Iron Man ends with Iron Man 3. He is not under contract to do Avengers 2 or any future Iron Man films. Now, this has been the topic for a lot of discussion and debate, but I bring it up again because in an interview, I believe it was with Variety, uh, Robert Downey Jr. just did talking about the character and talking about playing Tony Stark and his current status. He made a very interesting comment. Now, the reporter asked him about on the set of Iron Man 3, Robert Downey Jr. suffered uh, an injury while performing, uh, while doing the film. And the reporter was asking him about them. And then... Robert Downey said something very interesting. He this is what he said. This is the quote. It got me thinking about how big the message from your cosmic sponsor needs to be before you pick it up. How many genre movies can I do? How many follow-ups to a successful follow-up are actually fun? He then went on to say, I don't know. I don't know. Right now, I don't have a contract to do anything, and I did for the last five years. It sound, obviously, if you read these comments and you hear what he's saying, look, how, how many superhero movies can I do? How many sequels to sequels to sequels can I do while it's still fun? And listen, we've got to remember, Robert Downey Jr. has played this character for years. Years. This is his fourth film. Iron Man 3 will be his fourth film as Iron Man. Um, he's done a lot. Now, some people will point out that Robert Downey Jr. owes it to Disney and to Marvel to continue being Iron Man because 
being Iron Man is what resurrected his career. Remember, his career was dead and gone. And a lot of people, including the studio at first, did not want Robert Downey Jr. He was, like, he was, uh, you know, there was a stigma attached to Robert Downey Jr. for a long time. So I understand what people are saying when they say he owes it. But at what point does he not owe it to anybody anymore? He's done great as Tony Stark. He's, he's given so much life to that character. He's played it for years. He's done four movies as the character. And he's getting older. Like, he's going to be 50 in a couple of years. At what point do we as fans say, well done, to, to use a biblical verse, well done, good and faithful servant, go and rest. You know, at what point do we say to him, hey, you know what, just pat him back, say, thank you, RDJ, for doing such a great job as Iron Man. You deserve to walk away from it now, if that's what you choose. Now, of course, this brings us back to the whole debate. Then, well, what do you do with Iron Man? If Robert Downey Jr. decides it's time to hang it up and not play Iron Man anymore. Now, I've gotten some email from people who say stuff like, oh, no, no. If Robert Downey Jr. is not only Robert Downey Jr. can play Iron Man, only him, nobody else. And you seem to forget the fact that he wasn't even supposed to play Iron Man in the first place. They had other people in mind. There were other people that would have come after him had Robert Downey Jr. turned it down or had they not gone with him. And some people have suggested, well, if Robert Downey Jr. is not going to be Iron Man, then you just kill off Iron Man. Really? Look, I know that's a very populist thing to say, but I'm sorry. This principle holds true. Repeat this with me. The character is bigger than the actor. All right? Let's say that again. Take a deep breath. Let this cleansing truth flow through you. The character is bigger than the actor. If the unfortunate thing happens with that Robert Downey Jr. decides to hang it up, and personally, I believe he will sign on for one more film. I believe Robert Downey Jr. will sign on to portray Iron Man in Avengers 2. That's what I believe. But if he chooses not to, remember, I'm not talking about Disney shouldn't decide to replace him. I'm saying if Robert Downey Jr. decides, it's time to hang it up. Because if he still wants to play Iron Man, you let him play Iron Man. But if he decides it's time to hang it up, then you replace him. You replace him. Look, folks, I know it's, it's very popular to say, no, no one else can play him. But, but folks, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Maybe you'll have a hard time finding somebody who can play it better than him. Maybe you'll have a hard time finding someone that will make you forget Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man. But you can do it. You can't replace him. You can, there are a million very talented, super gifted actors out there who could step in. And we've, we've listed a lot of them on this show before and do a great job playing Iron Man. And what else can we ask? Because Iron Man is bigger than Robert Downey Jr. The character is bigger than the actor. And if Robert Downey Jr. decides, well-deservedly so, to hang it up, if that's what he chooses to do it's because he's earned it, then I think it's okay. We replace him, we put in a new Iron Man, and we move forward because the character and the story are bigger and more important than the actor portraying it. It's just the way it is. And I think if we just calm down and look at it rationally, that's the truth. Look, we all want Robert Downey Jr. back as Iron Man. I'm with you. We, You and I, my friends, are one on this. We are united in this lovemaking fest of we want Robert Downey Jr., but if he chooses to step away, then it's okay to go on with somebody else. Anyway, folks, listen, it is time for Mailbag. Now, if you've got a topic or a question you would like us to address on the show, uh, then simply email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Once again, that's amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Every day we pick out a few out of the mailbag. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions you guys send. And I've got a few pulled out today, so let's start with this. Michael P. writes, I've been watching your show for the last three months and I've become a big fan. Thank you so much, Michael. I have been disappointed in DC Comics on the handling of the Wonder Woman movie. With one of the memorable cast of characters in comics, do you think it will happen? And if so, who would you cast in the parts? Well, Michael, we, we've addressed a number of times, you know, ideal casting decisions. So I'm, I'm going to put that aside for a second. I'll let you guys discuss. If you guys have a great idea for who should play Wonder Woman, if they ever do a Wonder Woman, jump down to the comments section and leave your thoughts. We'd love to hear them. Um, but I, I don't think we can blame Warner Brothers or DC 
for the fact that there's not a Wonder Woman movie right now. Because number one, we all will agree that Wonder Woman, not impossible, but is a very difficult, it's a challenging, I'll use the word challenging. It's a challenging property to bring to the big screen. I know that recently they tried to do a TV series of it and it was just terrible uh, and they pulled the plug on it. It's a challenging character to bring in a way that doesn't feel like in, in the Avengers era and in the post Dark Knight era, it's difficult to sell a female superhero in tight red, white, and blue star studded with a lasso superheroine. Think about that for a second. That's, that's a tough, that's a tall order to fill. But more than just that, more than it being a difficult property to bring, bring to the big screen, because Thor was a difficult one to bring to the big screen too. I didn't think you could do that properly. And it's my favorite of the Marvel films, aside from Avengers. Um, but they did it. And so they can do it with Wonder Woman. But on top of that, the fault doesn't really lie with Warner Brothers. I contend that the fault lies with us, with the movie fans. We have not supported female-led action films. Now, some people will want to bring up the Resident Evil films, but those films are not on the level of success that studios like Warner Brothers or Marvel are looking for when producing these big, huge budget superhero films. We have generally not supported, and whether it's Aeon Flux or, or any of these others, when, when there have been female-led action films, we generally have not supported them. And that is our fault. That's on us. And I think... What the important thing here is that when a studio, whether it's Warner Brothers with Wonder Woman or another studio comes along, for instance, they're going to be rebooting Tomb Raider. Will we support it? I'll go on the record and say this. I think whether a Wonder Woman film um, really gets into motion, she may be a part of Justice League. I think it will partially depend. If, it, if Justice League hasn't happened by the time the new Tomb Raider movie comes out, I think that will play a lot into whether Warner Brothers decides to move ahead with the Wonder Woman film. Because if they the new Tomb Raider reboot comes out and Marvel sees that nobody supports it, it may they may want to keep Wonder Woman on the shelf. Say the audience is just not going out to support female-led action films. We need to support these films. Now, yes, we shouldn't just go pl pay money blindly if the movie sucks and we know that it sucks and we hear that it sucks. But if we hear that's pretty good, we should go out and support these films. Because if we do, more of them will get made. And that's the key thing. And so I don't put the onus on Warner Brothers or the studio personally. I know some people do, and that's cool. We have a difference of opinion on that, and that's fine. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. But I put the onus on us, the movie fans. Uh, so... That, that's how I would handle Wonder, Wonder Woman. Anyway, the next question comes from Matthew P., who writes, Hi from Britain. Well, hello, Britain. Love the show. My question is simple. Once the Hobbit films are finished, should the Cimmerillion be turned into a movie, film, or franchise like The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit? Um, I actually get this question a lot, and I've avoided answering it because I don't know how to answer it, really. I don't think you can. I, I think... Out of all of the Tolkien lore, I think the Cimmerillion becomes the, is the most difficult to make. And I think it would be the most difficult to make palatable to a general uh, movie-going audience. And honestly, of all the Tolkien fans I know, the Cimmerillion seems to be the least favorite. Not that people dislike it, but amongst the Tolkien fans I have, or the F Tolkien fans I know, it, the Cimmerillion isn't the one that people talk about. It's also very, it would be very tricky to portray. Now, The Hobbit is simple. It's a simple, I mean, I mean, The Hobbit is not simple. But in just telling the basic story structure, The Hobbit's a very simple story to tell. In Lord of the Rings, it's, it's quite definitive what that story is. And so you can, you can do it. It's a, still a monumental task to make it. But the basic principles of what the story are are kind of easy to do. The Cimmerillion is, is more convoluted. And I don't mean that in a negative way, just in a challenging way. It's the least popular and the least famous of Tolkien's books. And so I think when they're done with Lord... Plus, I think Peter Jackson's finished with this world. Peter Jackson, remember, didn't even want to direct the Hobbit films. I mean, Guillermo del Toro was supposed to be directing the Hobbit films. But things got delayed for so long, he had to leave the project to go and work on other things. So, remember, Peter Jackson didn't even want to do this. Uh, it's the least popular of all the books. It is the most challenging of the books to tell because this, it's, it's not really a linear story. It's very tricky to tell. And for all that, I don't think they will make it, and I don't think they should. I, I think they should just leave it alone, and um, we should just celebrate in the Tolkien universe that Peter Jackson has given us up to this point. All right, our next question comes from Brian M., who writes, You guys are my Siskel and Ebert. Thank you. I really love the show and wanted to ask, 
What happened to the sequel for M. Night Shyamalan's movie Unbreakable? I love this movie and was, in my opinion, the best movie he has ever directed next to Sixth Sense, of course. Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson were amazing. Please tell me a sequel is coming. Or has time made this only a cult classic? Um, well, Brian, I'm with you. I mean, most people love Unbreakable. I really liked it. I, I don't know that I say I loved it, but I really liked Unbreakable. It was definitely one of Sham Hammer's better films. It's, it's such a creative and different take on kind of the superhero genre in a very non-superhero way. Like, people say The Dark Knight is very gritty and realistic. Mm, nothing compared to the realistic feel of, if you were going to have superheroes, the realistic feel of Unbreakable is definitely, like, that's the most realistic feel to a superhero film I've ever seen. And, and you're right. There was talk of a, a sequel for quite a while. However... I don't think Disney is ever going to work with Shamhammer again. Um, there is a famous story, and of course, <clears throat> um, Disney was basically in charge of everything that Shamhammer did up until Lady in the Water. Because uh, Touchstone produced it, which is owned by Disney. Buena Vista distributed it, which is owned by Disney. Um, so it was a big Disney thing. Now, what happened was this. They were getting ready to make Lady in the Water, um, which, yeah, I'll say it. It is one of the worst wide-release studio motion pictures in history. I put it on the same level as Battlefield Earth, Catwoman, Highlander Part 2. I mean, this really is one of the worst films in history, ever, in the history of mankind. That's how bad Lady in the Water is. It's awful. So... What happened was uh, they were getting ready to make this film. And there's a very famous story. You can look this up online for the full uh, details. But there's a very famous story about how one night the head Disney executive had a dinner meeting with M. Night to talk about the script and the problems they had with it. Because Disney had some real issues with it. Say, look, this part isn't good. You're making the film critic the villain. You make yourself the writer, the, the one who's destined to save the world with your writing. You, make, you do this and you do this and you do this. And we have real problems. I think this needs a rework. Shamhammer was so angry that basically you know, he stormed out. He took the picture. They left Disney, all this kind of stuff. It was one of those things where a filmmaker and an artist got so big. And this is always a part of my argument about people who say studios shouldn't interfere with filmmakers. Nonsense. This filmmaking is a collaborative effort. And when filmmakers get too powerful or stop listening to other people around them, that's when they start making huge, huge errors. M. Night at that point had become, was very hot and very popular. And he was just at a point where he didn't believe he had to listen to anybody else. And he believed his script was perfect. And so he stormed out of that meeting with the Disney executive. Said, basically, essentially said, screw you, I'm making this movie the way I want to. And they left Disney. They parted ways. And, of course, you know, the Lady in the Water got picked up by another studio. He went on to make the film, and it went on to become one of the worst films in the history of cinema. Have, have I emphasized that part enough? One of the worst films ever. Um, and so I really don't think, and, and I don't know where the rights to Unbreakable lie. I don't know if they actually belong to Disney. I believe they do. But because of that, you're, you're never going to see Disney, I, I don't think, work with M. Night again. I could be wrong. Maybe they have some involvement in the upcoming After Earth. I don't think they do, but imagine they did. That would prove me wrong really quick, wouldn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think we're ever going to see an Unbreakable. I, I would be with you. I mean, I would really be curious to see another film. What happens to Mr. Glass and what happens? You know, I would want to see it, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think there's just way too many behind the scenes roadblocks to ever making it happen. And I think you're right. I think you pointed out in your question. I think too much time has passed because we're now 13 years later. And uh, I don't know that Bruce Willis would want to come back. I don't know if Samuel Jackson would want to come back. So there's all these in front of the camera issues and all these behind the camera issues. Because of that, I don't think we're going to see it happen. Well, listen, folks, that's all the time I have for today. Um, it's actually like 7 o'clock in the morning when I'm shooting this in Vegas. I actually have some more CinemaCon events I have to get to. I will catch you up to date. I'm actually going to be meeting with a cast of a few films today, and I'll fill you in and maybe even show you some of it tomorrow on tomorrow's show. And listen, on Friday's show, the show moves back 
to the AMC Movie Talk studios. Amy Rose Eisenbach, my associate editor at AMC Movie News, is going to be in the studio, and they're going to do the show from there. I will still be here, but I'll be back on Monday. So listen, while I got you, before you do anything else, click that subscribe button. You know, people ask me all the time, John, how can we support the show? Well, actually, we don't need you to send money or anything like that. The best way to support our show, click that thumbs up button and click the subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash AMC Theaters. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMC Theaters. And listen, go on out and see a movie tonight. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all your theater and showtime and movie ticket information. And listen, if you want an audio-only version of this show, look into the description of this video. You'll see links to our iTunes and our Stitcher radio. And once again, click that subscribe button. Once again, thanks so much for joining me here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'll be back in the studio soon. I'll join you again tomorrow. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. Bye-bye.